Have your Bibles. You want to turn to Luke chapter 18. This morning we'll have communion after the service, and there's a reason for when you're doing this. The reason is sometimes I, I, I wonder how we prepare ourselves when we come to church. And we're, we're so fortunate, aren't we, to, to be able to worship God freely. Amen? Amen. In this wonderful country that allows that. And, and, you know, who knows where the future is going here. But as of this time, of this moment, we, we have this wonderful opportunity to come to church. And, and probably there's none of us in this room who've been persecuted by coming to church. And, and we have this wonderful, wonderful opportunity and this wonderful privilege to do so. But my question to you this morning, how did you prepare yourself this morning? You know, somebody said, well, you know, I put on, I put on makeup. I'm talking to the guys now. You put on makeup. You, uh, you did all those wonderful things there. No, but you prepared yourself in that way. But how did you prepare yourself spiritually? I mean, did you ask some of these questions to yourself this morning as you were headed to, to, to this fellowship at this time? Did you ask some of these questions, you know, Lord, I, 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 I have, what, what do you want to say to me today? Lord, I really want to meet with you today, but, but Lord, I want to hear what you have to say to my heart. Lord, today I, I go to church, and, and God, I desperately need you, and I want you, and I desire you. I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to fall in this place, and the anointing of God to be so relevant here, that lives will be changed because of your presence. Did you prepare yourself and say that, Lord, today, of all days, this is the day that you have created. I'm going to rejoice in it. I'm going to celebrate with other Christians of the goodness of the Lord. But also, I'm going to declare my salvation as I sing songs and I praise and I worship. How did you prepare your heart today? I mean, honestly, you know, we, you know, I don't know about you, but, but uh, you know, I think I wonder what God is going to do today. And I always ask those questions. And, you know, most of them revolve around the teaching time, of course, but it's also around the worship time. I, I love, I love, I love, I love to sing praises. And, and we, we come way before y'all probably even get dressed and we're up here singing, you know. And Mike, you made a comment. He said, Mike made a comment as we're singing and practicing and getting the sound check. He said, Mike, what would you say, Mike? Yeah, this is... I didn't even take that. I didn't, wasn't offended by that either. <laughs> he said, this is my favorite time. As we... We, we, as we come, we, we just, we're all by ourselves here, and we just really, the praise him, we begin to worship the Lord and to ask for his presence to be in this place. And that's one of my favorite, it prepares my heart to do. And so we have an advantage for y'all because as we, we're singing and practicing, we are prepared for the presence of the Lord. So anybody wants to come join us, or in your car, you could prepare yourself. And that's really my question this morning. How did you prepare yourself? And maybe you did. Maybe you would just take for granted. And that's okay because we're going to address that today so, so that we can be helped by seeing what Jesus himself talks about when people go to church. The title of the message is a paradox. I'll explain that toward the end of the message. And yet we're going to divide, uh, just to, to try to look at, we're going to line for line this thing out. I think it's a rel relatively short message, but maybe who knows about all that stuff. So, so let me ask you again. How did you prepare yourself? Is your heart ready? Have you been praying that God would move in your heart today? Have you prayed that the Holy Spirit would move in this place and that God would really speak to you? And the parable that we're going to be looking at about two men that come to church and two different reasons why they came, but ultimately we're going to see Someone who was way up was really down. Somebody who was way down was exalted and lifted up. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful, wonderful parable that's teaching today. Lord, we pray for teachable ears, teachable spirit. Lord, that you would help us today to really see. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see the teaching of the Word of God. Lord, we're here to hear what you say. For that, we're grateful for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 9. Verse 9. I think we're doing NIV, aren't we, Joe? I think so. What? RSV. All right, RSV. All right. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. 
Now we're going to see who Jesus is really talking to. He's talking to the Pharisees. We see this in the, in the next chapter that Jesus talks to these Pharisees, particularly in verse 20 there, that he addressed these Pharisees. And so he's still talking to this guy. You remember in the preceding chapter, we see that, you remember the uh, healing of the ten lepers? You remember that story? That's a great story there, isn't it? And, and as he heals ten, only one comes back and praise the Lord. And Jesus makes this, this noteworthy thing here that he says that because of your faith, because of your praise, because of your direction in knowing who's the one that really healed you, who's the one that made you whole, the Bible says that Jesus looked to that one who came back and says, your faith has made you what? Made you whole. So then he begins to talk to the Pharisees. So we see that he's addressing these Pharisees. And notice a couple of descriptions here about these Pharisees. Notice the first thing that he says, that they're the ones who what? Trusted in themselves. You must understand the Pharisaical laws that were, were good laws, but they took them to the extreme of making themselves feel righteous because of the law of Moses and all these things. These are wonderful laws. These are wonderful practices in preparing for Christ and all those prepared Christ way. You understand that, don't you? And so in that, in that regard, those were good things. And what they were doing was a good thing in the religious sense. But Jesus came to fulfill that law. And in him is that fulfillment. All fulfillment is found in who? Jesus Christ. And so he comes there, and what he says is that, that they're, they're trusting in themselves. In other words, the Pharisees trusted in their own righteousness. They trusted in their own religiosity. They trusted in their own rights of religion, of all these things. And they trusted in themselves. And we're going to see how in this parable that this Pharisee is totally exposed of his heart. That he really trusted in himself. Now notice the connection with that. Did you catch that what Jesus said here? Well, not Jesus, but Luke made a comment here. Says, and he began to speak this prayer to those who trust themselves, that they were who? What? Righteous in themselves. Self-righteousness, okay? And then notice that next part, that they what? Yeah. They despised others. You know, I, I really think the two things that really upsets the heart of God is this right here. Is self-righteousness and despising others. And they go hand in hand. Somebody who is self-righteous thinks they're better than everybody else, don't they? And when you think you're better than everybody else, what happens? You despise others. We'll look at that scenario how Jesus plays us in. And this is what's happening as he's talking about those. There are many people who have stayed home from Sunday, from church today. And they view church, they review, they view organized religion. They view us as believers and followers of Jesus Christ as people they don't want to associate with. Why is that? Have we come across that we're so much better than everybody else? Maybe our own self-indignation, our own self-righteousness, and that we even despise others? This week, I have heard four times on four occasions how people in the work business have said, I'm a Christian, and yet they've turned around and they've been burning people. They've not acted like a believer. And these people that I've heard on four occasions this week alone, they've all said, man, why can somebody say they're a Christian and do what they do and treat others the way that they treat others? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Man? How can we do that? Are you one of those? Let's look at this. Jesus spoke this parable to those who trusted himself, that they were righteous and they despised others. And then he begins to talk in verse 10, as these two men, equal terms, as they come into the temple, two men come into, two men went up into the temple to what? To pray. And he goes on, one was a what? A Pharisee, and the other was a publican, or a what? Let's look at, first of all, the, the, the Pharisee, so, so we kind of understand where, where this guy's coming from. You must understand, in, in that culture today, now today we don't like, we hear the word Pharisee, we think what? And what else do you think? That's good. What else? <laughs> so you're not thinking this morning. Okay, when you see and you hear the word Pharisee, what do you think? Somebody who is what? 
prideful, self-righteous. What? Hypocrite. Legalistic. Le oh, maybe, there you go. That's the word I was wrong. Legalistic, you know. Y'all hearing those words? Y'all think that? Are we on the same page here? Okay. And so that's the way, when, when you, we hear that word, but back in those days, that was not seen that way. Do you understand that? So we've got the, the, the other side, so the, the final chapter on that deal. And so you must understand, in those days, a Pharisee was a very outwardly spiritual-minded leader in the community. They were well-respected. They were seen praying on street corners. They were seen in the temple area. They were seen as well men that were well-versed in the Bible, and they were well-versed in spiritual things, and they created a sense of of spiritual leadership everywhere they went. They knew the scripture too. You understand that? They memorized a lot of scripture. They put us to shame probably, most of us in this room. They wore scripture on their, their right hand, box, little boxes. They wore them on their, on their uh, foreheads, scriptures that they memorized, and, and particular certain scriptures, Ten Commandments. They put them on their doorposts. They, they knew the word of God. They were well versed in biblical knowledge, okay? So they were spiritual leaders. They're well versed in, in scripture. They memorize these things. And then they prayed a lot. They prayed at 9 o'clock and noon and 3 o'clock. These were appointed times to pray. You remember in Matthew chapter 6, we'll make some references there, when Jesus addressed the way Pharisees prayed, do you remember that? That they would be found in the streets and they would pour ashes over them and they would pray extremely loud so that all the attention would be, would be shown on them that they were praying and and, and, and they were doing those things. And so, so at 9 o'clock, at noon, and 3 o'clock, you would find these Pharisees in the temple praying. <laughs> we lock the doors here. You know, when comes to pray, you know. <laughs> and we don't lock you if you want to come pray anytime you want to. I remember 9 11, we just had the doors open. We didn't lock back then, you know. And, and, and people just flooded in here. The whole, the whole room was packed at 9 11. We didn't even have a prayer service. We didn't tell them. We didn't go phone. Even those things, people just started showing up. It was, you know, eternal. You didn't know what to do. Turn to God. It's a good place to turn to. And so, so you would find these people, they would be praying, and they would be, they would be doing this. And you understand also that they fasted too. Monday, Monday and Thursdays, they, they fasted. They were very, very, very faithful to fast on them. But during fasting times, they would pour ashes on their heads so that everybody would know that they were fasting. You must also understand that during those times they would come to the temple and pray and they would be on the street corners. Remember Jesus addressed that? He said, don't do that in the street. You go in your closet. You know, it's not about you. But then he exposes this heart of the Pharisee. Someone who is self-righteous in their religion and even in their relationship to God and they despise others. That's who this Pharisee loves. You must also understand that on Monday and Thursdays when they fasted, I don't know if you know this, so it's kind of interesting, I think. On Monday and Thursdays, that's the day that they went to the markets and they went to the centers and they would sell and buy things. Why did they choose those days? You want to take a shot at that one? What? Take people around. Who said that? Come right up here. You get to sit right here. That's exactly right. It was all about attention to myself. Well, I'm going to the prayer service, and I'm going to go to the street, and I've got the ashes on me, and I just want you to know I'm praying up for you. I'm, you know, that's, they wanted the attention to themselves, didn't they? Right? So that was all about them. Now, 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 now. We get to the public and our, the tax collector. Let me tell you about this guy. He was a spiritual outcast. You understand that probably he he was probably at the doorway of the temple. He probably really wasn't in there. In fact, he was an outcast that, that he was never invited to the prayer service. I mean, he was one of those guys who said, we don't want your time in here because you're a retrobate, you're a sinner, you're a thief, you know, you, you steal from people, you're, you're one of us, but you're not one of us, you're a traitor. And so, so probably he was at the doorway or he was out of sight from most people, or maybe not out of sight, but he was away from everyone as Jesus talks about this. So he's probably in the court area and, and, and just outside there. You understand also as a publican, that means that he was a chief tax collector. And what does that mean? You must understand that under, the, under these days, Roman government taxed uh, the people. They're, you know, they taxed them with the land, they taxed them with people, and then just of their, of their property tax. They had three different taxes there. And, and the Roman government would assign these, these Jewish people to be over. 
And a, a, a chief tax collector was somebody who would subcontract his area, and he would hire these other tax collectors to work for him. But this guy was the chief. In other words, he had a lot of people working for him. And he was a scoundrel. Remember Matthew? Matthew, Matthew the disciple? Was he what? What was he? He was a chief tax collector. He was subcontracted under probably this guy and worked as a tax collector. Can I get the idea? And so this guy really had this monopoly. He really maneuvered. He was a scoundrel of those scoundrels, and he was something that you didn't, you didn't uh, want to uh, be around. He also set his own rate. The government would say, here's what you owe. But then what he would do, he would say, if it's, if it's $100, he would say it's $150. And then those that were under him would even charge more. So they were robbing people that would set their own price rates. And so people looked at somebody who worked for the government, one of them, and they said, you are a traitor. You sold them. A likable guy, a thief, a scoundrel, a traitor. That's who this guy was. So now Jesus sets up this parable. And you talk about two extremes in, in the religion world, absolutely. And here he begins to talk about these guys. The first thing in verse 11, look what it says here in verse 11. We're just going to kind of read this here. I'm going to break through here. And the Pharisees stood and prayed thus with himself. We'll stop right there at that comment. The Pharisees stood and prayed. Now, now, first of all, when we say he stood and prayed, you're probably thinking, oh, he wanted all the attention. But you must understand, tradition allowed that and promoted that the people, when they would pray, would be in a standing prone position. So that's not the big deal. But probably, based on what Jesus is describing here, we kind of get this picture that when he stood, he wanted to make sure he stood in that prominent place where people would see him and hear him and recognize him and give that recognition and that adoration and that respect that he thought he well deserved. You kind of get the picture there that's happening? So as he stood in place, it was a normal thing to do, but trust me, he probably stood in a noted position where those would see. His motivation was all about himself, and we'll see that. The second thing that I noticed here that as he stood and prayed, notice when he said he prayed thus with himself. That's kind of a weird um, you know, phraseology there, is it? We okay? Is that my stomach or <laughs> In other words, what this is reflecting here, there's two things. First of all, it's that inward attitude. Thus with himself. In fact, that phraseology means as if you're holding the mirror and you're looking at yourself and you begin to pray. You kind of get the idea? Yeah? That's exactly what that means. Face to face, reflection of reflection is what that means. And so as he began to pray, he began to pray to who? Thus with himself. Do you hear that? Is that disgusting or what? Is that repelling to you or not? It's all about him. And we're going to see how it's all about him here. And he begins to pray in his own power, thus to himself. His own righteousness, thus to himself. His own regards to how he viewed himself to God. Didn't matter what God thought about him, but it was all about how he viewed himself. Thus to himself, he begins to pray. <laughs> it's all about him. It's all about what he thinks of himself. And so he, he had come to this designated time, which he came to three times a day. He comes to this designated time to pray, and he prays thus to himself. All about him. I'll never forget several years ago, I was preaching at First Pass Money in my own town church. I, uh, I, was, man, I was still in my 20s, I think. Yeah, I was in my 20s, and uh, the church had asked me to come be their pastor, which I did later in New Mexico. And, and I remember after I finished preaching there, and, and I saw this, this guy in the back, and he was in this band. And I always wanted to be, I always wanted to be in a band, you know? I always wanted to play rock music. And that's why you go, that's why some of you go, oh, so that's why he plays loud. Yeah, now yeah, we understand how he plays up there. I always wanted to be a guitar player and rock and roll, you know, and, and I, that's, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just going to tell you something, so y'all pray for me. But anyway, I wanted to do that, and I met this guy, and he was a great guitar player. He was in the band that I wanted to be in. He was in Dennis Crozier. 
and, and because this was, you know, I was in my 20s, so that was about 15 years ago. And so when, when, when I saw him, I said, hey, man, you're in church, man. And this guy, Father's thing for me in church, you know what I mean? I love those guys. Father's thing. He goes, yeah, man, I, I come here, you know, two or three times a month, and I, I kind of hang out. And he said, but let me tell you, really, the reason I come here, it's good for my business. Oh, I thought, oh, man. I said, dude, good for your business. What's your relationship with Jesus? Oh, that's good. That's cool. I mean, God's that one real quick. You know what I'm saying? Same attitude. I came for myself. It's about me. Notice what he said. The Pharisees stood and prayed thus to himself. God, I thank thee that I am not like other men, extortions, unjust adulterers, even this tax collector. Notice what he said there. I am glad I'm not like other men. See that self-righteousness, I'm better than you? Even to the point of, of despising. Now he begins correctly by praying, doesn't he? The Bible says when you enter into the presence of the Lord, into the courts, you're to enter into what? Thanksgiving with your heart, right? So he begins right, it sounds good, it gets the attention, it fulfilled the law that required us when we come into the presence of God, we're to do with what? Thanksgiving, he does that, right? Pretty interesting. God, I thank you. Everybody goes, oh, he's starting off good. That I'm not like other men. Did I hear that? Nothing to do with God. But as you look around, it's all about him, this self-righteousness, and all about how he's feeling about himself. He was righteous in his own opinion. That's what he goes on to say. I'm not like other men, extortioners. That's kind of an unusual word, extortioners. That's kind of like loan sharks, extortioners. In other words, you, you borrow money from somebody and the interest is so high and you know they can't pay it back. And what they do for uh, security purposes, they, they obtain something that is high valuable. And you know you can't pay back that loan. And so when you default on that loan, you seize their property. That's what it means. The Greek word we get from grasping. We get that word grasping, taking away from somebody. In other words, somebody's holding your hand and I, and I grab it out of your hand. That's where we get that word from. And, and the word is, is harpy. I don't know if you've ever heard that word, but we get that word harpy from. In Greek mythology, I don't know, let me, let me just tell you this real, real quick. In Greek mythology, they had these, these creature-like fowl, half bird, half human. And they were called, in Greek mythology, harpsies. And what they would do, they would swoop down, these foul creatures, they swoop down, and they would snatch the souls of people. And we get that understanding of extortioner. Here's what this guy said. Well, I don't steal from people, God. I'm not like an extortion, extortion, extortioner that steals from people. I don't do that. I, I don't steal from people. And that's what he says. He goes on here. That, that I'm... God, I think I'm not like other men. I'm not extortioners, and I'm not unjust. In other words, he's talking again about his, about his fairness, about his life. He's a fair guy. He treats people with fairness is what he's saying. And then he says, those who say, I'm not an adulterer. You know what he did right here? He did the, the seventh and the eighth and the ninth commandments. And he begins to say, Lord, I think that I don't steal. I'm not an adulterer. I don't have it. I don't grasp things from other people. Somebody owns something. I don't try to take it from them. So what he's saying is, I am so righteous because I'm not an adulterer. I don't steal from people. And I don't cut it. That's what he's saying. And so all this righteousness is built upon of what he views himself. And he says, I'm so glad I'm not like all these others. There's a guy named Rabbi uh, Josiah. And Rabbi Josiah made this on it. I read this in the William Barclays of commentaries years ago. It's always stuck in my mind. And here's what this Rabbi, Rabbi Josiah said. He said, if there were only two righteous men in the world, it would be I, it would be me and my son. And if there was only one righteous person in the world, it would be me. And that's the attitude that this Pharisee has. Father, I thank you. I'm not like other men. Extortioners. Unjust. Adulterous. And then he goes on to say this, and here's the kicker on this last step. Or even like this tax collector. In fact, emphatically, it's in its emphatic form. 
and he specific he gives specifically that I'm not like it's almost like he's pointing because it's an emphatic phraseology. And I'm not like that guy right over there. That's what he's doing. Well, I, I thought about this last night. I thought, wow, that's an incredible statement there. I mean, this guy really points the finger at that guy. And so I began to think, about how did he know this guy was struggling over there? So my thoughts were, you know, when, when, when that public and that tax collector came in, He's so anguished. We're going to look at that in a few minutes. He's just, he's broken here. And he's, he may be, tears may be coming down. He noticeably is an outcast in there. And there's something going on. And he picks on him. Look at that guy. He's got a lot of stuff in him. Look, he's weeping and crying. And I'm up here standing just bragging on how goodness I am. Look of everybody else. And look at him. He's weeping over there. There's something going on. We'll look at him in just a minute. But there's something going on here. I'm so glad I'm not like that. I, I thought about that. And I thought about churches today. How when people walk through those doors that are hurting and broken, how do we treat them? You know, I mean, we can maybe go over to them during the week and say, hey. And then, then they share their heart. Well, I'll pray for you. Bye. How do we respond to that? To me, I've always told you the most important person in a building is the one who has the greatest needs that we would minister to. Do you understand that? So when people come, and I promise you, every Sunday, even today, there's somebody that's so broken here today. How do we minister to them? Do we just, I know you, you guys love people. You know that I've never been in a church like this before that just love people, are genuine about that. But, but I'm asking about that next level. Of getting into their life. The Bible says that we're to be tenacious, and that is a war zone when we stand in the gap for other people. It's hard to really, really support them on people. Or we just outbreak them. And you might do that. You might be flippant about that at all. How do we respond to that? I thought there are those that come to church and they walk in those doors, our doors. I'm not going to say anything else about any church, but our doors. How do we treat those that are broken heart? I know how Jesus did. But how do we do that? So he says, I'm so glad because of his self-righteousness. I'm not like that sorry God. That went over there. That's what he really did. He goes on. Verse 12. If that wasn't enough to give a claim to himself, how righteous he is, he begins to talk about some of these physical attributes that he does. Notice here, he says, I fast twice a week. And I give tithes of all that I did. I fast twice a week. I've already talked about that a little bit. The two times that he did was on Monday and Thursday, and then usually that's when he'd go to the market area that everybody knows that he was fasting. He had the ashes on his head, he looked apart, he's he's a spiritual man. And everybody thought he was spiritual because he looked on the outside. And then he began to find those things. So where did the Pharisee fail in this? And just basically this is that the most displeasing thing that I think to God is when we are self-sufficient. That we on our own self-power. And that we have no use for God other than a display or a banner to put on our lives that others will like us more. Did you notice something? Five times he used the word I in his declaration of prayer. I, 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 I. It was all about him. Wasn't it? I thought about that too. I thought, you know, they're, 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 they're Gospel being preached, I, I, I'm not coming back up. There are sermons that are being preached today that talks about how you can feel better about yourself. And there are self-help sermons that are out there. I get that. And, and you know, there's sometimes we need to encourage one. There's a difference between encouraging and, and really depending on the Lord to encourage us. There is a difference there. And, and, and trust me, you know, I understand that difference there. And I, I try to teach all that and preach that difference. But but here's what happens is, is that it's a it's a... It's a feel-good thing. And here the self-righteous, the one who doesn't really need God, who's self-power, self-sufficient in all things, I do all the right things, and because of that, he says, I'm good. Now we get to the southern guy. Verse 13. 
the word but. Now we see this contrast. Anytime we see the word but, there's this there's this this, this contrast that begins to unfold, and we see the differences here, and we see this the characteristics between the uh, Pharisee and the tax collector. But the tax collector standing far off. You have King James that says afar. That's a that's a West Texas term. term. <laughs> We ask where a town is, and then, man, that's a four off. That's a four piece off. You know, that's how we talk in West Texas. And so, so that's a West Texas term, get King James a bar. But it says here, but the tax collector standing far off. In other words, there was something going on with him that he felt like if he got too close to the altar of God or the, 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 the place of prayer and and, and those artifacts that are in that room, if he got to place, he would probably just dissolve because of something inside of him that caused him to reflect upon his unrighteousness. But here's the interesting thing that I think here. I think that something is happening in this guy that he realized what is going on in his heart. We'll look at that. But he also realizes that it's just a matter between him and God. That he's kind of like over in that corner, if you would, or maybe if we were facing the other way. Here he's over in this corner. And he's kind of hiding behind this bush because it's not about if somebody's going to know him or see him or recognize him, but it's a matter of he's in this place of worship, this place in the presence of God. And he realizes he's so unworthy. He wants to do business with God. It's not about who sees him that, that has come to church as much as it is that he wants to do business with God. And that's my point. When we come to this place, do, do we really, it's not a matter, the fellowship is wonderful here. You guys are way out of control about how much you love each other and take care of one another. Y'all are just incredible. But when we come to worship, there is that point where it's just when God wants to do business with us. It's not about anybody else in this room. So we enter into that time of worship. So here's what it happens. He says, but the tax collector was standing apart. His attention was only on God and not himself. Notice what it says there, the next thing. No, 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 no. Not there. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. Tradition in those days, when you pray, you lift your hands. It says, I desire that you lift holy hands in the temple. So that, that is God's tiny stillness inside. It's very free if you feel to do that. We encourage you to do that. For a moment. But here's the normal thing. Notice what it says. He didn't lift up his hands. In fact, notice what it says here. He says he felt this grief, this, this guilt in his heart, this brokenness because he's in the presence of God. And he realizes his unrighteousness is known before God, a holy, righteous God. I'm not present, God. This sees everything that he's done, everything that he's thought, everything that he's going to do. He sees all these things that he's broken, and he doesn't even have the strength to leave and look up with his eyes toward heaven when he prays. He can't even do that. Because he knows who God is. He knows what's in his heart. He's broken. Y'all see that? Please, see that with this guy. And then, that's what he says. He begins to flood. He begins to beat his breast. It's almost like he, he, he doesn't have the words. Almost like what Paul says, I didn't come with eloquency of words and flattery. Jesus Christ crucified him. It's almost like he has nothing. He, he needs to confess, and yet it's just so so much agony in his heart and his soul. And he begins just to beat, beat it out of him, almost like he's got to force this out so that he is saved. Do y'all see the agony that's in this man's heart? It's not self-promoted. It's not for show. It's genuine. Because notice what he says. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me. Sin. This word mercy is kind of a different word there. It's you get the word expiation from it. And that means just simply this is that 
when there's broken relationship, the only way to re the, 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 the only way to restore that broken re relationship, that flow line, is through God's mercy. That's that word there. Normally, we see the word mercy. We we see we don't get what we really deserve. But this is identifying that there's a sin. This word mercy is a really special word here. It's talking about uh, repenting from something that that is causing the flow of God into my life. It's almost like having an IV in your arm, and you, you pinch that IV, that, that substance that gives you the nourishment, that substance that gives you life, whatever that is, that IV, it's almost like you pinch it off. And, and what he's praying for mercy, he said, Lord, remove that thing that stops our relationship. Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me because there, we, there's that broken fellowship, and I can't live without that. You hear the desperateness in his life and his heart here? He begins to pray to him. Lord, have mercy on me. Remove that sin. Remove that thing that breaks our relationship. And then notice what he calls himself. A sin. In fact, in the Greek, there's, there's not the article A. It's article B. And here's what he's saying. He said, Lord, have mercy on me. The sin. The sin. It's almost when Paul or when uh, uh, David prays about a contrite heart, fully exposed. I'm the worst sinner. Paul says that I'm a sinner of sinners. See that? See that attitude? That that heart? Is, he's not looking around to see who he is better than. He's not comparing himself to anyone. He's looking in the very presence of God. He realizes that he is the center of all sinners, and that's the only thing that matters. Now, God takes sin very seriously, doesn't he? And we're doing that. And he deals with this in the presence of God. He cries out, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. And here's what Jesus says about this. Let's go to the next verse. The bottom line is this. If there's anything short of what Jesus has told us, then it's not what God wants to do with us when we come together in this place every single time. So the choice is always you. When you walk through these doors, what, what are you really, what is your heart's desire? Is it really about you, I, 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 or is it really about what God, who God is, and what He wants to do in your life? If anything, listen, if anything is short of that, then you will walk out here still the same, still the same, still the same, still the same. And I don't really believe you're here this morning because you don't want to be the same. Amen. I don't want to be the same. I desperately need God. I know what I can do. So I, I desperately need God. Here's what Jesus said in verse 14. He goes, I tell you, I love that. If you imagine Jesus when he says that, these, these Pharisees, his disciples, he tells this story, and they're going, what? And then he looks at him and says, I tell you. He says, listen to this, big boy. I'm going to tell you the truth. Listen, listen carefully. I tell you. This man went down to his house. In other words, he went back home. Justified. Then the other. That word justified means he's cleansed. Just as if he didn't sin. He's made clean. Amen? Yes. That's what that means. <laughs> so if you want something different today, I'm giving you the secret right here. This is it. If you're tired of living your life the way that you do and these habits that just keep coming on you and these thoughts and this is the way that you can be cleansed today. He offers this to everyone. And here's what he says. I tell you, this man, what man? That's him. That's right. The tax This man, this man went down to his house just by rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. The parable tells two men that have come to pray. 
One man, it's all about him. It's all about his righteousness. It's all about all the good things that he does. All about his past experiences perhaps he's had with God. And he rests upon that. He talks about how others think about him and how others view him. In fact, he even points the finger at somebody who's broken in that room. And the Bible says that that man goes back and he's still the same. And the parable with this is simply this. There's a paradox here. That the layout, those who exalt themselves, the layouts, it's a downward spiral. You're still the same. Those who are way down, who are broken, who are humble before the Lord. Jesus himself says, and they will be exalted. They will be lifted up. They will be encouraged in Monday through Friday and Saturday to live a life that's pleasing to God. And here's the deal. I'm done. And here's the deal. This scenario is played out in this room right now. I mean, there are those here that you've come and you said, Lord, I, you need to deal with my heart. Lord, there are things in my heart today that, that I need you. I need for you to cleanse me, to be merciful, to remove those things that cause that life flow not to flow in my life. I am so dry, and I need you. And there are those here. You walk in the same, and you're going to go right out of the same. It's your choice. But you do have a choice, don't you? I don't know what you want to do, but it's been my prayer today that you will surrender everything to the Lord. Starting right now. Amen. The Bible calls it this way before we have communion, and that's why we waited. The Bible says that before we have communion, we're to prepare our hearts before we're to take the Lord's Supper. In other words, we're to confess our sin. We're, we're Anything that will defile the table means that we just have this stuff, sin, and we're just going to hang on to it. It doesn't matter if I take communion or not communion. It doesn't matter if I go to church or not church. I'm still going to be the same. God, you can't do anything about it. Yeah. So the Bible says when we have communion, it's a time for repentance. A time for asking the Lord to cleanse us and renew us and refresh us and, 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 and just to confess to the Lord those things that that's what church is about. So you have a choice this morning. It's my prayer that you would choose to confess your sins and ask the Lord to forgive you and, and to seek after Him, that you would surrender all to Him. And so what we're going to do, we're just going to have a moment of prayer, and then and then we'll bless the communion time. And, and during that time, I would ask the Lord just to speak to your heart, that we would confess anything before Him. That based on this parable that in this scenario we've played out, even in this room, that you're not, you're determined by God's grace and His mercy, not by your own strength like this other guy did, but by God's mercy and His strength that you're going to go out those doors differently. And when you do, the Lord says, I will exalt. Shall we pray?